Welcome to History for Granite. Join me to explore ancient Egypt. Together, we'll uncover secrets that only stones from antiquity can reveal. Please subscribe to the channel to get notified when new videos are published, and thank you so much for growing the channel. The Great Sphinx of Giza has captured the imaginations of everyone who has laid eyes upon it since it was constructed in, uh, well, a very long time ago. This oldest surviving megalith statue is truly one of a kind. The attention, mystery, and controversy that the Sphinx attracts never ceases. Throughout history, humans have invoked its projection of power to meet their own needs and desires. Now, full disclosure up front, I don't find the Great Sphinx nearly as interesting as the pyramids of the Old Kingdom. The pyramids are constructed with millions of stones containing movable parts, innovative engineering, and intriguing anomalies. In contrast, the Sphinx is a relatively solid piece of weathering limestone carved out of a hill. It's still a magnificent specimen, 72 meters long and 20 meters tall, with plenty to admire, but it doesn't grab my curiosity quite the same way. However, I can understand why this unique monument receives an oversized amount of attention. After all, there are many pyramids of Egypt, but only one Great Sphinx. When thinking about why the Sphinx captures so much attention, there is an enormous amount of mystery as to what it might represent. This riddle carries over into the question of who built the Sphinx, and why so many people are keen to identify a creator. As mentioned in my video about carbon dating the pyramids, the Sphinx cannot be radiocarbon dated because the original monument did not contain mortar with organic material. Furthermore, there are no ancient textual references which associate the Sphinx to a specific Egyptian pharaoh. It has been argued that a now eroded section of the Dream Stela once had a fragment of Khafre's name still visible. But a potential uncontextualized reference from a thousand years after Khafre, now lost to time, is not a compelling body of evidence. We then must rely upon the context of the Giza Plateau to determine who the Sphinx belonged to. At a first glance, Khafre seems the obvious choice. The Sphinx and its temple are adjacent to Khafre's Valley Temple and the causeway which leads to his pyramid. Indeed, it is the position of Mark Lehner, who wrote his PhD thesis about the archaeology of the Sphinx, that the statue belonged to Khafre. But while it seems likely the Sphinx ended up as part of Khafre's mortuary complex, it's much less clear if the Sphinx or its temple were constructions created during Khafre's reign. There is a tradition of Egyptian pharaohs appropriating sites and artifacts from their predecessors, and this phenomenon is well documented through thousands of years of Egyptian history. The stepped pyramid of Djoser, the first pyramid ever constructed, was found to possess tens of thousands of stone vessels from earlier dynasties beneath it. My favorite example of an old kingdom pharaoh exerting power over history is from the fifth dynasty king Unas. He plowed over an enormous tomb, probably belonging to a king of the second dynasty, to build his pyramid and causeway. Furthermore, he stole an inscribed block of Khufu, builder of the Great Pyramid, and placed this stone in his burial chamber. The carved relief of Khufu is still visible when illuminated from the side. Look at me. Look at me, he says. I'm the sun god now. The tradition of appropriating status from earlier pharaohs means caution is warranted before assigning creatorship to something unusual at a king's burial. And it's safe to say the Sphinx and its temple are a very unusual find at a pyramid complex. The Sphinx Temple and Khafre's Valley Temple sit a few meters apart. Their designs do have similarities, such as twin entrances, but either could easily have been constructed to imitate the other. The problem of analyzing these temples is quickly confounded by the Sphinx Temple seeming to have been redesigned during construction, and the general consensus that it was never finished. The main evidence the Sphinx Temple remained unfinished is the interior masonry was clad in granite, but the exterior blocks never received this cladding. While almost all the granite has been quarried away, you can always tell where the granite was placed because the softer limestone floors were cut down to seat the harder granite facing. Khafre's adjacent valley temple received this final granite exterior. Next comes analyzing the geology of the Sphinx and adjacent temples, which is an even more controversial subject. 
This channel is history for granite, not history of granite, and so I will refrain from giving an extensive geology lecture. What I can say briefly about the topic is that geologist and independent researcher Colin Reeder has done some of the most impressive and extensive work on the subject. He also has a new book out about the geology of Egyptian landscapes and monuments, which I will link to in the description. It's important to highlight the good work independent researchers are doing. The main point about Reader's work on the Sphinx enclosure concerns the erosion that is visible most prominently on the western and southern walls. He attributes the deep vertical fissures and rounded faces to high-energy runoff from rainfall that would be directed towards the Sphinx enclosure based upon the topography of the Giza Plateau. You don't need to be a geologist to observe the erosional patterns there are distinct from the body of the Sphinx or the blocks in the adjacent temples or the other potential oldest structures that lay exposed on the plateau. I will quickly clarify that other types of erosion are occurring as well, including exfoliation from salt, abrasion from wind, and subsurface moisture wicking. These factors all combine in complex ways, and this is why there is no consensus about what the erosional patterns mean. Colin Reader's analysis of the runoff patterns in the Sphinx enclosure runs afoul of institutional Egyptology because it means the Sphinx enclosure must have been excavated before the large pyramids of Khufu and Khafre were constructed. When these pharaohs dug into the Giza Plateau to quarry stone directly west of the Sphinx, this would have stopped high-energy runoff from the higher plateau being directed towards the Sphinx enclosure. Reader's conclusion is that therefore the Sphinx was constructed one or a few dynasties earlier than Khufu and Khafre. Mark Lehner and Zahi Hawass strongly disagree, and there's a real howler of a line about it from their 2017 book about Giza. They write, quote, that the Sphinx is a creation of the early dynastic period is an extraordinary claim, so it would require extraordinary evidence. End quote. Mind you, this is the same book that writes of the Great Pyramid Queen's Chamber shafts, quote, Hawass believes that there are chambers still hidden inside the pyramid, and that these doors may be the keys that will open these secret rooms. End quote. That's about the most sensational claim you could make about the Great Pyramid, leaving out aliens or magic. No evidence is provided to support such a claim, nor even an explanation of the logic behind the statement. Let me be perfectly clear that asserting the Sphinx might be constructed a few centuries before the 4th dynasty is a mild claim very much in line with a well-documented pattern of Egyptian history. A reason why Hawass and Lehner would call such a claim extraordinary is that it disagrees with their conclusions. From my perspective, the clearest visible evidence to support Colin Reader's analysis about the erosion pattern on the Sphinx enclosure being driven by high-energy runoff is on the southern wall. You can see how the erosion is somewhat reduced as you travel eastward, and then there is a sudden reduction in erosion where a large fissure cuts across the entire Sphinx and its enclosure. Logically, the fissure would capture a large amount of runoff traveling from the west, thereby reducing the erosion beyond it. It's difficult to model how the topography of the Giza Plateau would direct runoff in antiquity because so much of it has been modified by humans over thousands of years. That subject alone could easily take up a whole video, and I'm not going to dive into it because I don't think anything worthwhile can be concluded with confidence. Lehner and Hawass, in their 2017 book, write a long rebuttal to Colin Reeder, citing that rainfall can still find its way into the Sphinx enclosure. They claim the strongest rainfall they ever witnessed at Giza in 2010 as evidence of ongoing surface erosion. But if in their over 40 years of experience, a foot of standing water in the Sphinx enclosure is the most they can come up with, one could easily interpret this as evidence in Colin Reader's favor. Hawass and Lehner claim a few generations between Khafre and the end of the Old Kingdom would be sufficient time to produce the erosion we see. But the Sphinx has been cleared of sand for a century in the modern era, and I've not seen pictures that suggest any noticeable runoff erosion occurring in the last 100 years. And let's not forget that the Giza Plateau near the Sphinx has been modified in this time as well, which reduces the usefulness of present-day runoff analysis. One more point from Colin Reeder is how the more durable Member 1 limestone at the bottom of the Sphinx enclosure is less eroded where a cutting was made for the Sphinx temple. This is evidence that most Member 1 erosion in the Sphinx enclosure did not occur between the construction of the Sphinx temple and the present day. 
You can dive way deeper into the geology by examining the condition of the stones in the Sphinx Temple and comparing them to Khafre's Valley Temple and the Sphinx itself. Furthermore, stone and mud brick walls were added to the Sphinx enclosure as early as Tutmos IV, 1,000 years after Khafre, and they seem conspicuously resistant to runoff erosion. But before you think you're sure what the erosion around the Sphinx means, I want to drag you back up to the Giza Plateau to the Great Pyramid of Khufu. Observing the surviving Tura casing stones at the bottom course of the pyramid is a good reference for how difficult this analysis is. A few casing stones are almost perfectly preserved, while others on different sides of the pyramid show stronger yet completely different erosional patterns. And unlike all the variables about the Sphinx and its enclosure, we can be confident these stones are all the same quality of limestone, quarried and installed on the pyramid in short order. There's no way to know how much exposure any particular stone had to the differing elements of nature, so we can see how dramatically small variables add up over thousands of years. Now, taking a step back from the geological evidence, let's look at some contextual anomalies around the Sphinx that offer clues about its origins. For myself and many other researchers, the enormous causeway of Khafre is the prime candidate. This causeway is oversized. The now demolished walls and ceiling covering a walkway between the temples only spanned about half its width. Another critical feature of the causeway is that it was not built out of blocks, but rather what remains of the original Giza Plateau before it was greatly quarried on both sides. The causeway is thus a significant boundary for any construction that might have taken place before Khafre's reign. There is also something highly conspicuous about the path this causeway travels, starting just south of the Sphinx at an oblique angle and leading to what was once the most prominent location on the Giza Plateau, where Khafre's upper temple now resides. Egyptologist Vassal Dobrev believes the Khafre causeway would only have been constructed this way to avoid the Sphinx and its enclosure. He then makes the most modest assertion possible, which is that Khafre's older brother Jedifre built the Sphinx in the small span of time he ruled after the death of Khufu. But even this minuscule adjustment to the age of the Sphinx is something Mark Lehner finds repulsive. Maybe Jedifre made the Sphinx in honor of his father Khufu. Well, maybe, but there's no proof of that. There's not even any way to test such an idea. Well, if I were to test the idea that the Khafre Causeway and Valley Temple were constructed to avoid the Sphinx, I'd start by looking at the alignment of other pyramid temples and the connection to their respective causeways. Sure enough, Old Kingdom pharaohs always seemed to center the causeway to each temple as best they could. Not all temples have been found to examine, but even before Khafre, we can see that Khufu's upper temple had its causeway centered even though it intersected at an oblique angle. This pattern shows Khafre's causeway intersecting his temples at their corners is not what would have been considered ideal. If the Sphinx and its temple were not built or planned for their current location, it would have been very easy for Khafre to build his valley temple a bit to the north to maintain symmetry. The upper temple of Khafre is centered to the pyramid itself and also sits upon an elevated natural point on the plateau, so its position would not have been as flexible. The opinion of Mark Lehner is that the location of the temples, causeway, and sphinx were all part of a master plan for Khafre, and thus the present arrangement was the only way to fit everything together. Lehner claims the sphinx temple was constructed with blocks primarily quarried from the sphinx enclosure, thus the two monuments must have been built concurrently. But the stones can only be matched to layers of limestone in the plateau, and those layers span quite beyond the sphinx enclosure. There are also many stones in the Sphinx Temple that must have come from distant sources. It would be wonderful to examine this data ourselves, but Mark Lehner has never published it. He writes in both 2017 and 2020 that he intended to publish this data from 1980, but hasn't gotten around to it. Considering how much difference of opinion there is about the geology in the limestone around the Sphinx, the just trust me bro explanation isn't very convincing. Even still, its likely documentation from over 40 years ago might get misinterpreted when reconstructing it. We are nowhere near a standard of extraordinary evidence. But even if Lehner is correct, and the Sphinx and its temple are the same stones, assigning their origin to Khafre is an entirely separate argument. 
Lehner believes the Khafre Valley Temple once had an enormous enclosure wall to the north that was later incorporated into the body of the Sphinx Temple, which proves they were contemporary structures. But just because the enclosure wall intersected the Sphinx Temple doesn't mean the enclosure wall had to have been there first. This idea also plays against the argument that the odd arrangement of the causeway and temples was the result of a master plan. And even the shape this original enclosure wall might have taken is conspicuously askew. If there was nothing in the way of the enclosure wall, it would have been an easy way to square off the northern side and return symmetry to the valley temple. It's also a straining argument to say the causeway and valley temple were built in such an unusual way to accommodate the Sphinx and its temple, which must have followed them, and in case of the Sphinx temple, built at the very end because it was never finished. That's a lot of accommodation to make for something that was left uncompleted and conspicuously not replicated by any other pharaoh to follow. You don't need to carve a sphinx out of a bedrock hill. Any other pharaoh could have made one quickly by cladding a mound of rubble with Tura limestone and carving the features. Compared to the pyramids, it's not a big job. The more I study the pyramids, the more I appreciate the practicality of their design decisions. It might seem that nothing is less practical than stacking enormous blocks so high, but these constructions would never have been accomplished if shortcuts and efficiency weren't maximized. With that frame of mind, everything on the Giza Plateau would have been made to optimize construction of the pyramids. When looking for an explanation about anything in the necropolis, that seems like the safest place to start. Khafre's causeway is the largest and most important barrier for any construction paths that could have occurred. The main pyramid quarries for Khufu and Khafre lie directly adjacent to its north and south. It's very difficult to speculate which quarry area was used by Khufu, because most evidence of excavation would be removed by Khafre when he digs deeper at a later time. Mark Lehner's pyramid construction model had most of Khufu's pyramid quarry placed south of the Khafre Causeway, with an eastern section of the northern quarry also used. This northern quarry had a few mud seals of Khufu embedded into construction gaps that offer the only textual clue about the area. In this building model, Khafre was just extremely lucky that a small strip of connecting plateau was left between the two quarries, which would later become his causeway. In 2017, when Lehner and Hawass attempt to discredit Colin Reeder's idea about runoff erosion, they realize the North Quarry presents a problem, and they redate it to Khafre, writing, quote, We now see good reason to believe Khafre's workers made this quarry, end quote. But they provide no explanation for this revised attribution. There's a mountain of inefficiency occurring in Lehner's construction model, particularly with a double enveloping external ramp, and the longest, most winding path possible for the heaviest Tura and granite stones that are placed high above the king's chamber. But Mark Lehner isn't an architect nor an engineer, and so perhaps it's unfair to expect him to have worked out all those problems. Architect Jean-Pierre Houdin's construction model for the Great Pyramid is that Khafre's causeway was the original construction ramp, taking a straight path from the harbor with quarries feeding the local limestone from both sides. It wasn't luck that a straight line of bedrock survived the construction of the Great Pyramid, it was integral to the process. Most Egyptologists agree that Khafre's causeway was the construction ramp for his pyramid, based upon its location and size, but Houdan saw it was an optimal path to meet Khufu's needs as well. If Khafre's causeway predates Khafre, that's a very strong indicator he may not be responsible for the origins of the Sphinx. But let's take it a step further and ask ourselves why Khufu might have chosen this location for his Great Pyramid and its construction ramp. The causeway is nice and straight, with a very consistent grade leading to a high point on the plateau. It's not the most direct path to the footprint of the Great Pyramid, but it does account for additional space required for a straight ramp that would rise up on the pyramid's southern side. Might some pre-existing settlement at Giza have informed this construction path? Let's say the Sphinx predates Khufu, and an ancient path leads right past the Sphinx to a nice viewpoint at the top of the Giza Plateau. The ancient causeway gives you a full view of the Sphinx as you walk past it, so that all the fine details that make up the haunch and tail can be seen as you travel to the vista at the top. This is the same journey that countless tourists travel today. 
When Khufu comes to Giza, it would be most efficient to use a pre-existing roadway for construction. You get the bonus of a godlike statue where workers must begin hauling enormous stones to build an unprecedented monument. That might be a nice motivator to convince your workforce that such a thing could be accomplished. Egyptologist Rainier Stottleman thought Khufu built the Sphinx based upon the style of its Nemez headdress dating to his reign. He was a mentor to both Hawass and Lehner, who writes in 2020 that during a friendly dispute over the matter, Hawass once asked Stottleman, quote, If Khufu made the Great Sphinx, what was its purpose? End quote. Without the context of a construction ramp leading from the harbor in front of the Sphinx, this is a great question. The Sphinx as it appears today seems entirely disconnected from the Great Pyramid. But if one is willing to consider the work of architects and geologists outside of Egyptology's inner circle, a satisfying explanation is provided with a construction sequence. Perhaps a better question to ask would be, if Khafre made the Great Sphinx, what was its purpose? Why would Khafre so greatly compromise the layout of his valley temple to accommodate it if the Sphinx and its temple were to be the last constructions left unfinished? When the Khafre causeway was no longer a construction ramp, it gained walls and a ceiling so the Sphinx would no longer be visible from it. Why make an enormous statue where it has lost most of its visibility? When looking at competing ideas about the Sphinx, it becomes clear why Mark Lehner is so adamant in his position. If you grant legitimacy to any alternative idea about the history of Giza during the 4th dynasty, many of his conclusions fall apart. With that said, there's still lots of uncertainty with competing ideas about the Sphinx. There's a ton of research to do, and like Flinders Petrie said, a discovery is not made until the data has been published. Maybe Mark Lehner is correct, and the Great Pyramid was constructed with an inefficient ram system without exploiting the nearest quarry, serendipitously leaving a strip of plateau for Khafre to use as his causeway, which he would design his valley temple around, planning for the Sphinx and its temple, but never getting around to completing. Well, maybe, but there's no proof of that. There's not even any way to test such an idea. When looking back nearly 5,000 years, the chasm of time is always going to leave enormous uncertainty. I present you this model for the Sphinx because I find the story better aligns with my understanding of the pyramids, which are much closer to my heart. Maybe some form of the Sphinx predated Khufu, and he fashioned the headdress or other parts in his own image. Perhaps later Khafre adopted it into his mortuary complex and integrated the temples. This makes sense to me not only because the Egyptian pharaohs appropriated power when convenient, but because you find this pattern throughout history to the present day. A certain individual, who formerly had absolute power over the Ministry of Antiquities, still insists on giving his lectures right in front of it. When history repeats itself so consistently, it's very hard to be confident about what the origins of the pattern were. We're a long way from understanding the full history of the Sphinx, but we all get the appeal of claiming the power of a lion to make ourselves seem so very important. Thanks to everyone who watched this video to the end. Please subscribe to the channel to see more of this content. Give a like or comment as you see fit. And above all, Remember to ask your friends if they take their history for granite.